most people that I meet that are frustrated, they joined a job because of the things they were going to do, but they didn't ask enough questions about who they were going to do it with. Hey there, friend, you're listening to the Hot Mess Hotline, and this is Stephanie Crevins. You are totally in the right place if you're an ambitious leader who wants to pull off a big transformational project. In order to do that, you and your team need to upskill in the process and tackle old problems with new ways of thinking. In the past, we would have called this change management and leadership development. But frankly, I don't think that's enough anymore. We need something more nuanced for the rest of the 21st century, and that's exactly what we have for you here. These executive level conversations are nuanced, insightful, and hard earned lessons that you can put into practice as soon as this episode is over. Small tweaks can have a huge impact. Take what's new and useful to you and leave the rest. Today's conversation is with Adrian Kaler. He's a leadership engagement expert and senior partner at the executive coaching firm, Take New Ground. When you visit your website, you're going to fall in love with them as quickly as I did because on the top of their page, it says, let's turn leadership into leadership. You all know why I love this so much. There's so much about leadership development that is ineffective. And my friend Adrian and his his colleagues over at Take New Ground are turning leadership into actionable insight. During this powerful conversation with Adrian, you're gonna hear how he took his multiple passions, his multiple different ways of thinking and what he thought his career was going to be and how he turned that into becoming a successful executive coach. How it how it went from being maybe a source of embarrassment to a source of pride and how he now uses that in order to bring those v- variety of experiences and benefit his clients. Let's dig in, my friend. Dude, Adrian, let's dig in. Tell us about your hot mess that you want to share with my friends here. Yeah. Well, first off, thanks for having me on the Hot Mess Hotline. I think this is really great. And we were exploring about what might I have gone through or what might I be going through that could be you know, reflective of what other people might be going through. And one of the things for me was the process by which I got to integrate my varied history into what I'm doing now. So I've been, I've been coaching founders of companies for about 13 years now. I didn't always just coach founders. I coached anybody with a paycheck and a pulse when I got started. Let's be clear. You know, pay me anything. We'll do it. That's um, how launching a coaching business goes. Yes, sir. <laughs> and yeah, thanks, mom. You know? Um, yeah. <laughs> So, you know, but now I'm, you know, now we're focused in, we found the people we love working with. And I remember when I first got started, one of the scariest questions that that my clients might ask me, and if you're listening, you might think about if you're maybe transitioning into a new career or something, mm-hmm. uh, you're up against this, you know, you're going to get the question around your history and your resume. And how do you make this make sense? Because you always obviously want to be seen as somebody that's on their toes, heading in a certain direction with a level of confidence and certainty that can generate the experience of trust on the other side. Mm -hmm. I know for me, the scary, like, how did you get into this field? I wasn't satisfied with kind of my natural answer, which was I kind of wandered into it because people don't like that. That doesn't Uh, build credibility. It might build trust, but it doesn't build credibility. Right on, right mm-hmm. on. And so, you know, I'll never forget his name was Tyler. And he asked me that question. And I gave him the real answer. And I'll give folks that are listening the real answer in just a second. But I gave him the real answer. And he said, that's great. I didn't want some kind of regular dude to work with me. I was like, what? He's like, yeah, the fact that you've done this and this and this and this, that actually makes me lean in and trust you even more. I was like, wow, I didn't even consider that. I'd been mm-hmm. busy trying not to look like a fool instead of finding the ways to relate to my history in a way that generates wisdom yes. or generates the fact that I could, I'm being a nerd now with my language, but the fact that like the fact that I've done all these things, it actually uh, gives the appearance, which is actually true that I've handled myself in multiple different disciplines. And for a guy that he was in the wealth management world, he's been doing it 25 years for him. That's cool. And I hadn't even entertained that. So, that's kind of the hot, the hot mess. And I'll tell you where I got to with it that, that really served me and now makes me really unapologetic and on my toes. And I know how to leverage things and, and all that now. So 
you know, so I've been doing this 13 years, which is coaching executives now and founders of companies and used to be coaching like senior, uh, you know, middle management when I first got started. I'm 43. So I started when I was 30. So I coach people that were at like my age whenever I got started, you know, out of college, I was like a pre-med kid in college and thought, oh, I'll go be a doctor. I, you know, I understand science really well. I'm a nerd like that. I love everything, you know, science based and fast, easily fascinated, uh, which might be the way I'm wired or might be a choice. I'm not sure either way. It's definitely a thing that I'm into. I love being fascinated. And, I, and when I tell my I've got a couple little kids when they're when they're, you know, they're bored, they will say. And I said, oh, that's a choice. I wonder what you're not wondering about. Oh, I love that. And love like, being, that. being bored is just such a victim stance. Yes. And we won't get into it, but I've got lots we'll, of. We'll tackle that in a little bit, but yes, 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 yes. It's yeah. like you know, the, the the world is not entertaining me in a way that I actually get to, you know, be outside of myself, which all of uh -huh. us be is to be outside of myself, which, you know, fancy people call that a flow state these days. Yeah. Um, and let's so have that, let's have that our next recorded conversation, like consumerism and constant entertainment and lack of silence. Yes. Yes. Let's yes. do it. Let's do yes. it. The, the, the despair. Oh. Kierkegaard would talk about the, just the despair, not knowing itself as despair. So anyway, I was nerdball and thought, oh, I'll go be a doctor, you know, par right. partially, I mean, I don't know how other people get to it, but there was some family conversations about me and what I'm capable of and what I, you know, as I eat, my grandmother thought I'd be a great doctor. She never, <laughs> uh, you know, she never got a doctor in the family. Her father was a doctor and I was like the best, the last hope. <laughs> uh, the only one of the, uh, the only one of the grandkids that was like that academically wired. Yeah. Uh, but anyway, I'm halfway through a, a freshman year. I'm playing football at a little school in Illinois called uh, Millican University. And I realized I don't want to be a doctor. I'm not, you know, I like these people, but I'm not, I'm not like them. Like mm -hmm. I get off on the data. I really don't want to do research the rest of my life. I do love the science, but I love people. So what do I do? And serendipitously, my roommate was a nursing major. His father ran the ER in Gary, Indiana, and which meant pretty cool, pretty crazy. Yeah. And like cool and crazy. And I think, yeah. I, you know, wow, I'd never like entertain that idea at all. Fast forward. Four years later, I got a bachelor's degree in, in nursing. What did I do after that? I moved to Chicago when I worked. I was chasing a girl, as you do, and, uh, you know, interviewed a lots of different hospitals, but fell in love with the tour and the people I met at the Children's Hospital. Children's mm. Memorial is what it's called. And so okay. in that region of the country, like it's the spot, you know, if you if, if anybody's in serious trouble, they chopper them to Children's Memorial. So I got a job there. And I'm decently competitive, so that worked for me to go work at this elite place. They, mm -hmm. let, me, they let me be in the what they call the resource team, which is like a substitute. Like you get trained on every floor and you show up and you don't know where you're going to go. They will do four hours here, four hours there, four hours there. I was fascinated with all the data. Even more than that, I got at the, at the time that I was getting a great education on the ability to read people, the ability to mm -hmm. assimilate information quickly, to mm -hmm. make information quickly to think on your feet to, to see step into a group and like either gel or not or figure it out yeah. right on and you gotta like identify mm -hmm. resources i was always yep. in my you know, as soon as i walked on the floor i know there's going to be a helpful nurse and there's going to be a smart nurse hopefully it's the same person not always not routinely actually there'd be yep. something that's really nice that if i needed to figure out where the linens are she'd tell me but and there's also the person I, I talk to whenever things go sideways. So I got really good at reading people and reading, you know, how to build trust quickly and get things done because, you know, you have to do that in that, in that environment where you're doing, you know, 50 things in a, in a 10 minute period. So anyway, worked there, worked and I worked mostly in the pediatric intensive care. So that's kind of the the creme de la creme from a nursing perspective, yep. all kind of pushier nurses and type A. It's also obviously life and death. So you get Love a the adrenaline rush. Like, yeah. They yeah. never mentioned that part. And I'm like, oh, you're adrenaline junkie. Got it. Okay. For sure. Everybody yeah. in there is very yeah. adrenalized and it's go time. And they're all really confident, all really smart. It's a teaching hospital. So you're working with doctors that are like your age or younger. And so they're all scared, more scared than you are because they've got more responsibility and they've, they've responsible for so much more information and they've got the power of the pen. They can actually do life and death decisions. So you actually call them on the car. It was like a flat organization in that way. Cause like now you got to manage the doctors as well. And they're, 
they're scared to, for you to know they're scared, but you know they're scared just by their body language and such. But I'm in charge of the room. Like when my patient's there, the doctor comes in, let's say, you know, they don't educate very well. I got to go outside and say, hey, man, hey, come back in here. You left them in a mess. They need to know this and this and this. So it was fun. I mean, and I knew that I knew that like in that context, the the job for the kids is to distract the kid, you know, and help them not realize or think about how bad it is or how bad it could be because those existential questions aren't fair for a child. Meanwhile, you've got a mom that's typically frantic, just stereotypically speaking, moms go into mom mode and like control mode naturally. And, yep. you know, I think people, they're wired to be that way. Dads are usually quiet and angry. And so typically, and then my job is to get people to come to the table, despite what's going on despite all their fears of you know they're having the worst day of their life and they're, yes. they're looking at death and they can't imagine life without their child understandably so and you got to be the one that's the calm in the storm mm -hmm. and bring people together so i did that for a good while i didn't ever really want to be a nurse long term i didn't want to you know i i would always naturally want to like rise up and climb the ladder but the ladder in the hospital system just means you're more administrative and i'm not administrative at all i don't want to write policies i don't want to manage you know vacation schedules and that kind of crap that's just not me i, I want to do hand-to-hand -hand combat stuff not sit back at a distance so anyway did that for a few years came out i uh, i've always had some kind of like spiritual background my parents were uh leaders in a local small church in the middle of nowhere in illinois and so that that was baked into me. I kept some of it, lost a lot of it. All that to say I was involved in a church this is in Chicago and we were overseas in India doing some service project type stuff. And somebody gave us a, uh, a talk or like a sermon by this guy named Erwin McManus. And he had the music. He had like talked about this kind of Judeo-Christian arc um, and the purpose of it in a way that I never heard before. And I thought, oh, this guy. OK, okay. I don't know what I'm going to go do. I could really do anything and as a nurse you can go work anywhere which is great but this guy thinks about life and thinks about the purpose of life and thinks about these big existential questions in a way i'd never heard anybody talk before he's mm -hmm. quite quite the, the warrior poet and i said okay great let me go out and check out los angeles so that's what got me out to la which is where i am right now okay, and I nope. came out and i did like an internship in mosaic and was all i'm an all-in type person so i jumped in really no hesitation let me make the biggest splash i can while i'm here and what's forward. Mosaic for our friends who don't know? Mosaic is a church in Los Angeles. Okay. Okay. Yeah. And at the time, it was about 3,000 people, which in the okay. city is a big deal. And we didn't have like one building. We had like several locations around the city kind of pop ups, you know, and I was involved in the one downtown at a nightclub. So we had church and nightclub on Sunday nights. About 700 people would come to it. Pretty cool. Mostly within, between the ages of 20 and 30. Sure. And very, very creative, very entrepreneurial. Um, and anybody could come. We were inclusive before it was a political statement. It was just it, into what we're into. Like, oh, you belong here before you believe anything. You don't have to believe anything, period. You could be like, fuck God. We're like, great. Come on in. Perfect. Have some coffee. Yeah, Love it. that's have right. So I was just really involved, really involved and loved it and loved people and didn't know what I was up to, except for the fact that I love people. I know that people are always asking these very big questions and need other people that are asking the same questions that might yep. be one or two steps ahead. Mm -hmm. And I was down for that. And I've been doing that throughout college and high school anyway. So fast forward, they have this master's program where you go back and get a master's in theology and you get like something to go build. And so I was very activistic by nature just because that matters to me. And if I'm going to make my life count, I might as well make a contribution. That's always been what, what mattered to me. Not like, what am I going to do for me? What am I going to do for the people? That was very satisfying for me. So mm -hmm. they, asked, they asked me to do that work. And then eventually they asked me to stay and come on staff, which I was happy to, to do. Mosaic was growing like crazy. This guy, Erwin, you know, they were asking him to speak and travel and, and go everywhere around the world. And so they, that meant they gave punks like me an opportunity to go speak because he didn't want to go everywhere. So all of a sudden I'm 25, 26, 27, and I'm traveling around the world, talking about leadership, talking about character development, talking about being a redemptive force in the world, which the church ought to be instead of become some kind of citadel that's all dogmatic and stupid. Like, hey, let's go make a difference for other people, which is, you know, which was refreshing to people. Yeah. So got this to will be our third, our third podcast episode of digging into church and spirituality. I'm down. I'm all down. Right. <laughs> um, so did all that. Loved huh? it. 
I ended up generating this thing called Serve LA, which was this network of people that wanted to go make a difference. And I, you know, can, there's 30,000 nonprofits in LA, but build all these uh, connections between us and those nonprofits and us and the mm -hmm. city, and the county. And then we, about 2,000 people a year would go out and do something. I, I would just tell people, you give me an hour of your week, I'll make it your favorite hour of the week. It'll be what you talk about at the cocktail party. So, yeah. and I'll connect you to something meaningful, something you've never done before. You're scared to death to go do it, but your life will be changed, not theirs, or maybe theirs, but definitely yours will. Just because, you know, when we take a risk and get outside the norm, our brains turn on in ways that they don't, as we're just kind of having a normal Tuesday or whatever. So, I'd gone through all these trainings. I love, you know, personal development, leadership development mm -hmm. stuff. I've been a leader as long as I can remember and always want to keep up in my game and always want to be around people and new ideas and, and new mentors and that kind of thing. And I'd fallen in love with this guy, Dan Tacchini, who was a mentor. And I thought, oh, man, if I could just be around him, he's world class. Like, and when it comes to leading a group through, like, group transformation, best in the world, best in the world. He says there's yeah. one other guy. I don't believe him. But Anyway, I want to hang out with this guy as long as I can. Yeah. So I had a choice of what to do, you know, and I could like go work as a pastor anywhere, of course, but that's usually pretty boring. And I would probably get fired from most churches or <laughs> yeah. nursing stuff, which again, doesn't have a, you know, doesn't have a ladder that I'm interested in climbing, or I could go do philanthropic things, but most of that's paperwork based. I could go work in the nonprofit world, but I actually wanted to go make some money. Anyway, decided to go be a coach. I'd gone through this coach's academy, decide, you know, it, to be a coach, what do you do? You just wake up and say, hey, I'm a coach now. So um, you can go through trainings. That happens, I, yeah. Yeah, I, I went through some trainings. You know, it's not like I'm just color by number type coach guy. It's all about presence and all about listening. Yep. And so you, you never know. It's like skydiving every day. I'm going to jump out of the plane. We'll see what happens. Hopefully yep. I'm prepared to handle what's going on. Yep. So that's how I got involved. Now, the point of the whole story was the fact that I've been all over the place. Now, you could interpret that as being unfocused. You could interpret that as being scattered or being immature or being a hot mess. Yeah. yeah flaky. Like, yep. Yeah. Flaky or something. Or, or, I mean, I never applied for a job. All these came to me uh -huh. uh, where, you know, and, and I looked at them and said, oh, wow, would this, I always saw it from the lens of people that I would work with versus things that I would do. Cause I think mm -hmm. that, I think that's a more, most people that I meet that are frustrated, they joined a job because of the things they were going to do, but they didn't ask enough questions about who they were going to do it with. And oh, think, damn. Yo. Okay. So like, this is, this is like truth bomb central right here. Ask more questions about who you will work with versus yeah. the work that you will do. Yeah. Yeah. I tell clients all the time now, I said, if you set up a culture where people become the person they want to be, they'll never leave. Because uh, that is that is what human beings want, is to develop and to become. That's where hope comes from. That's they want to belong. Like, they want to belong like, somewhere. Right on. They want to be yes. seen, make their life count, know how to win, you know, all those types of things. So, you know, what I, it, so for a long time, I was kind of squeamish about it. But it hit me one day about what's the through line? Right. Mm -hmm. And even if you're thinking about your own transition, maybe you're going to go take a leap. You can ask yourself, what's the through line? Like beyond just the stupid resume thing and the company and the title and all that. What did you learn? What did you practice? What what were you an expert at in the being realm versus the doing realm? You got to get clear on what you did and all that results. Fine. People want to hear all that. But people are buying potential when they hire you. Mm -hmm. I hope they are. They might be buying your experience, but that's what fools do. Don't buy history, buy future when you hire somebody. Yeah, so, I want to hire the person in three years, not the person today. And I'm going to be the person alongside you to the three-year mark. Right if on. you take responsibility for the parts that are yours to take responsibility for. Right on. Yeah. And so it, it hit me that what I was an expert at was being with people mm -hmm. in chaos at yep. a major crossroads in their life and helping them make the most courageous decision that could generate the future they really want. Yes. And that's a super long statement, but you got to get the gist of it. Like I'm, I'm the guy at the crossroads that like helps people find themselves, be themselves, make courageous decisions and move forward with dignity and integrity. No matter what happens, they're going to like bring themselves to the surface and IE transform in order to meet the needs of the moment, which mm -hmm. for most people would crumble them. But these folks with a certain handful of ideas in their head and connecting with their heart and such 
they move forward, even despite the fear, despite the insecurity, despite their imposter syndrome and all the stuff people like to hide behind. It's like, no, 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 I can still make a choice. Yes. And so I found out, I, I just realized, I guess, that that's actually what I'm the best at, is helping people have that honest conversation, which is frightening. I was just with a team the last two days, a uh, startup that's going to launch here this month. And one of the things I wrote on the board is like, the truth will set you free, which is an old rabbinic idea. The truth will set you free, but it's going to scare the shit out of you first. Oh. <laughs> Did they forget that part in the Torah? Is, did exactly. they forget the latter half of that statement? Exactly. Because <laughs> the truth is uh, frightening. That's why most of us live in a fantasy and don't yeah. want to deal with current reality because yeah. we don't want to deal with the truth. We think the truth will crumble us, and it might, and it, and maybe it should because we need to be crumbled to be. Yes. You don't have a resurrection without a cross or blah, blah, blah. You got to like die in order to come back and, yep. and be reinvented. Most people are just scared to death of death instead of like, oh, no, no, this is part of the process. I got to keep. I got to keep undoing myself so that I can redo myself. And for some, that looks like immaturity. It looks like being a flake or whatever. Or it might be the biggest life hack you've got because I could just undo. I could, you know, put me really. I could go work anywhere. I could go. I know I could go do anything because there's a handful of skills that I do really well. And I'll listen really well. I'll learn very quickly and I'll take action even if I don't feel like it. To the point of the whole podcast, like, you know, if you... If you're about to make some kind of transition, you must generate a narrative that actually pulls you to the surface. That's really unapologetic instead of like, you know, oh, this, oh, that, you know, that I, and you keep covering up and kind of playing not to lose. I would say mm. you get a narrative that's compelling to you and authentic for you. You can't lie. They'll, yep. they'll sniff it. And you got to keep doing this work until you know you're not lying to yourself. It's just funny. Like when you pick an interpretation of an event, especially if it's distinct from the previous interpretation of an event, you know what I'm saying? Like sometimes something bad happens in our life and then we tell a big story about why I can't do something because of that bad thing. And yeah, then you put yourself in victim mode. Oh, well, it's me. Look how hard my life is. Exactly. And then sometimes mm -hmm. you can just make a new decision. No, no, no. That thing didn't crumble me. It made me strong. Yes. And then all of a sudden you're actually making yourself a liar because you've been telling this big story and selling yourself on it and selling other people about it. And then you just change your mind. It's like, no, no, I'm done with that. Like that relationship, you know, I really, I really messed that relationship up. It's not them. It was me. And then all of a sudden we make ourselves a liar and we don't know what to do about that. But actually that's the most liberating thing is if, we, if, if we're willing to attach ourselves to the most, uh, what was it? Most resourceful, but the interpretation of our history that opens up the most amount of possibility for the future. That's what we're looking for. And, and your ego, I mean, just, I, I like to distinguish this because you as a human being, you are light, love, compassion. You are an image of God, whatever words you would like to use for God on this earth, from my belief perspective. And it is your ego that is afraid. It is your ego that tells you to stay safe. It is your ego that tells you to lie, to protect an image. Like as soon as you can see your ego for what it is, which is very little more than a, an internal part of your brain that evolved millions of years ago, designed to keep you safe and to connect or stay connected to other human beings. He can trample right over that son of a gun because it doesn't, all it's designed to do is to keep you physically alive. It's right. not made to make you thrive in the 21st century. Right. It's not made to help you live out your authentic calling and be in right relationship with people. Like right. it is your ego that tells you stay small, stay safe, tell people what they want to hear so that you think that they like you so that you can stay connected around the campfire so that you all don't get eaten by the saber tooth tiger. Right on. That's what the ego is. Yeah, we, we call them this four survival needs, looking good, feeling good, being mm. right, being in control. Mm -hmm. And those aren't going anywhere. I think to your point, you know, we're like our brain is doing that. Now, I, I say our brain's not our friend because it's doing that. You don't get a vote on it. That's gravity. Right. Now, what volume are those conversations in our mind at any moment in time? I get to choose that. Like yeah. if it's, it's going to be there. I know even just whatever. I just said I was like two days in this room. I know I'm insecure. I'm going to be insecure. I, I'm going to think I'm a fool. They don't, I'm not going to, I'm going to mess this up. I'm going to blah, blah. I know that those conversations are coming as yes. on Monday morning when I wake up at a hotel yep. in San Jose and about to walk down to the thing and with yep. all the, some of them intimidating people to me, kind of. And I know that every damn time. I know my, my loop is the same. 
Yeah. What have I gotten myself into? Why did I sell this? Who am I to think I did this? Right on. Now, but then I get to choose what's the what is the loudest volume, you know? So these people matter and I'm here for them. Yep. I'm not here to protect myself and look good and feel good and be right, be in control. I'm actually here to help them get their stuff done. I wonder what they want to get done. And now all of a sudden we're in a brand new conversation. Like, what do we what do we want to do for these next two days? What would be thrilling for you guys? And all of a sudden I'm out of my own way yep. and I'm actually here for them. Like they are at the front of the room, not me. Like the content isn't going to come out of my mouth. The content's in the seats. And all of a sudden I'm beyond the ego conversation as much as you can ever be beyond anything. You know, I, I, I think you got to make those choices every single moment in the day. But you also support them in getting out of their ego because they see your vulnerability, which right is on. an unbelievable presence in this world. Right on. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I usually talk about that early just because they, because I look cool and calm and collected like mm -hmm. I did that. Say, oh yeah, I woke up this morning scared to death. No, what? You? Yeah. Oh yeah. Yep. Uh, and here I am anyway, because you matter more to me right now than I matter to me, and my ego matters to me. So, yeah. you know. And by the way, that if you start doing that in this team, you start doing that and at the workplace, and like listen to others, not just go confirm what you think all the time. You ask some questions instead of just be there to broadcast or. Uh, are there to like listen and be open and reflective instead of just having your dogmatic view about something, your whole life gets better because the yes. world is up. There's other people here. Yep. So we've been jamming for quite a while. Yeah. <laughs> I think well, I think we I need to plan out like five more episodes. We got a lot yeah. to dig into. But sure. to, to tie to tie the um to tie the topic together here in terms of that okay. moment when you told that guy about your background and what the through line was, two questions with that. One is what what got you to the point where you no longer gave a shit about what he thought about your background? Uh, I don't think I ever got to the point where I didn't give a. Shit. Okay. I don't think I did because I do give, a shit. and okay. and I'm actually really proud of my background, and I became it became distinct for me that if people didn't honor the my process I did to get to where I am, no problem. But if that's like a if for whatever reason, what I was doing 20 years ago bothers them, then get the out of here. You know, I want to talk about here and now. I know why my presence with you and my way of being with you will open up huge possibilities for your life. I know what that's about. If you want to focus on me, no problem. But that's for me. I'm not focusing on me. It's about your life is the content of this whole thing. So I'm not here to be like vetted and what should I have been doing or something. Mm -hmm. If you know, if, if there's a concern there, it just means that I'm not generating enough value in the moment. You know, we're doing this whole like kind of dance. Yeah. Like we're checking each other out. No, I want to talk about the future. So it's really not even about where you've been either, by the way. Your history is of very little interest to me. What you're committed to in the future is massively interesting to me. So I'll tell you what I'm committed to in the future, which would be a fierce advocate for you. Mm -hmm. And you get what you want and I'll do it in a way that we might not, you might not like me in the moment in time, or I might say something that even is offensive or seems out of nowhere or something nobody says to you because you're a big yep. shot. But yep. I, I'm willing to put the relationship at stake every single conversation. Yes. So that's what I, so I don't know that it didn't matter. I mean, it's not, that, let's see, it's not that, it, it's not that his opinion of my history didn't matter to me. I just was certain that other things mattered a whole lot more to me than his opinion. Okay. About, you know, okay. and if that was a thing for him, then we're probably not a good fit anyway, because I'm here to get something done. If you want to talk about my resume, okay, fine. But go, go down the road. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. I'm always curious about, and I use strong language just because I do. I'm always curious how people get to the point where they're able to detach from other people's expectations, other people's like a need to be liked in order to win anything or sell anything. It doesn't matter if you're selling yourself. It doesn't yeah. matter if you want to get a project approved, but being able to detach from the other person's perspective of your likability is, is a huge leap in self-awareness and self-development. And so yeah. like, how would you say that, how would you say that you've done that effectively? Yeah, a couple of things come to mind. First off, that's only troubling when it's a private conversation. So if I take that concern, which is a decent concern, like okay. what does the other person think about me? That's it. If I'm in a sales conversation, that's important. So I can either just be insecure about it and make up 
what he thinks about me. And that's what we naturally do in this looking glass self, whatever Skinner thing, you know, it's like, I, you know, it's like, we don't, our view of ourselves is a reflection of what I think you think about me. That's mm -hmm. what I'm referring to. The yes. looking glass self. So we could do that privately and that's trouble because we're all our worst, best, our worst cynic, right? We're all, all our, our harshest critic or whatever. So if I move that from private into public and I ask, how am I doing in this conversation? What are you thinking about? You know, it's, I won't do it quite like that, but I want to know what my impact is, you know, at, especially at the end of like a first call. Um, what was this conversation like? You know, and I want to know. So I'll get yeah. real feedback, number one. Number two, so two things. That's the first thing is actually moving from a private to like a personal conversation. Secondly, to in some ways to reiterate the previous point in a new way, that's not going to go away. S I need to to generate an aim that's more important than my own ego, which is what who this person is. Because if I'm busy being interested and concerned about them and then interested and concerned about where they're going, the volume, that's the metaphor I use on like, how am I looking and how am I being? That's going to go down because I've decided that my concern, my aim, my focus is on these other two things, them and the future we're creating together. So it doesn't go away. I don't need it to go away. I just put it in its right place. Gotcha. That's a helpful metaphor. I think it's, I'm with you. I think where I'm at in the journey is I'm trying to detach and it's not that I don't care what people think about me. Like I deeply care about human beings, but because I'm here to make an impact like you, like I deeply care about what can we do together given who I am and who you are yeah. and how I think about who you are is irrelevant. And I think, and I, I would word it currently as how you think about me is irrelevant. It's do we want to come together and do something really freaking awesome? Yes or no. Right on. Cause right. I don't have all the answers. You don't have all the answers, but right together, on. man, we could do some really cool things. So this has been wonderful. Thank you for this. Yeah. conversation. Yeah. Thanks for jamming with me. This yeah. is really fun. Another one anytime. Let me know. Yeah. Yeah. I love, um, not a lot of people like this back and forth due to the speed of the conversation can keep up. So that always makes yeah. me happy. All right, you got to run, sir. I got to hop, but good to All be right. with you. You too. Thank you, Adrian. Bye-bye. See ya. Bye. Ooh, we, my friend, didn't I promise you a powerful conversation? He and I were jamming on so many different things. Here's the bottom line that I hope that you take away from the conversation. This is certainly my bottom line, is that your experiences, your past, they come together like a string of pearls that always benefit you in the moment. For me personally, you know, I've seen I've seen pieces of my career come full, full circle. You know, I never thought that I would use my disaster recovery experience at Catholic Charities in my learning and development firm here at the Change Architects. But when the pandemic hit, the lessons that I learned from disaster recovery and how people and businesses and communities recover from a hurricane was directly applicable to how we recovered and re-entered re -entered the economy, re-enter the workforce, how we work together in different ways because of the pandemic. Those lessons were directly applicable. And it's the same thing with Adrian's career. So I invite you to sit down and think through what are your career experiences and how can you connect the dots so that you can solve the problems of 2024, 2025 and beyond with what you've learned in the past. Not, not saying, you know, well, how I did it back in 2008 is how I'm going to do it in 2026, but the lessons learned from the past, you can certainly connect the dots into the future so that you can continue to solve problems in creative ways. And the other piece that I'm taking away from my conversation with Adrian was his focus on bringing people together and how folks are always asking the big questions um, at a deep, deep level. And so I invite you, what are the big questions that you need to ask and answer in your life right now? And how can you bring people together in order to serve in a new way based on what your company needs, your team needs, the world needs right now? All right, my friend, let's get back to the big, impactful, transformational work that you're working on right now. Take what is helpful in this episode today and apply it in new ways. And if you have another pro troublemaker in your network that could use this lesson, I would be honored if you would share it with them because I know if you got value, they will too. I'll see you soon, my friend.